Welcome to the episode two of part two of this artificial intelligence class here at NYU, 11 a.m. New York City Live. So thanks for tuning in today for a new lesson of ours. And what did we talk about these days? So, well, the first part of the semester, I already told you uh, at the beginning of last class on Monday, uh, what we kind of cover very uh, succinctly, succinctly, I don't know how to spell this word in English, I have to pronounce this word in English, I know how to spell it. Uh, succinctly, I think, yeah. Uh, so, well, yeah, I, I told you about what we cover in the first part of the semester. Then we start talking about a first instance of classification. And we were going there uh, with a model-based machine learning algorithm, which means that we are first building a model. And what is this model, right? So I think there was some confusion, uh, perhaps, about what was going on over there. So we were building a model of the different things we are dealing with, which are the random variables, which were the features and the specific class. And this model was the full joint uh, probability distribution. Then we were a little bit, mm, what is that thing? We kind of maybe forgotten. So let, let's restart this class because uh, from where we left off, actually giving you a, a small a recap about the uh, probabilistic notions that are required for actually being able to understand what's going on in this class. As usual, uh, you are supposed to communicate with me uh, through the chat whenever there are uh, confusing parts, you don't know what's going on. Uh, I explain something which is hard to understand. Again, it's mostly my fault. It's the first time I'm teaching this class to an undergraduate uh, group of students. Therefore, if it doesn't make sense, it's on me. Please let me know. It doesn't make sense. Good. I mean, not good, but I mean, great. I can actually try to do a better job in explaining things. OK, so again, don't worry. Uh, I'm not grading you about the uh, interaction. Actually, well, that, that's the point, right? So we are um, I'm asking you questions for uh, uh, verifying your comprehension of what's going on in class. So if you understand things, just type in the chat. Uh, we we'll see who interacts, who doesn't interact. And that uh, feedback is very helpful for me to give you a better lesson that is tailored to your uh, necessity, your needs. And also, moreover, we might use this uh, uh, interaction as also like a, a tool to round up your grades at the end of the semester. Again, someone was asking how much it's worth it. Well, if you've been uh, interacting with me a lot of times and answering the correct things, not the last person answering, but you know, it's easier for us to um, bump up some grade in case you it is required or necessary. So as I, tell, I told you before, let me uh, re recap a little bit these probability things because, uh, okay, don't write private messages because I get very confused in the, <laughs> I mean, unless you're earning, you can write private messages. Students, please don't write private messages. Let's figure out how this probability works once and for all, okay? Again, if you don't know what's going on, ask. So I go quite quickly over the things we covered last uh, on Monday, then I will slow down a little bit for the things that are uh, new, okay? All right. So summarizing uncertainty, we said we have a degree of belief over some specific statements. Instead of having true force, we have this kind of belief. Then I said it was wrong uh, because not uh, every toothache doesn't necessarily mean you have a cavity. We can say basically toothache means you have cavity or gingivitis or abscess or all, all many things. But since there are infinitely many uh, in a row, I can't specify all of them. I have to. So it's going to be a wrong rule as well, right? Unless I, I specify all of them which is not possible. We can flip the thing. Um, I can possibly say a cavity means I have a toothache. No, it doesn't mean that is also wrong, right? Cavities don't have to mean uh, you, you have a toothache. And so we introduce this, again, uh, belief of over uh, this cavity, which is a lowercase uh, statement, which is, is, a, is a proposition. So what is the uh, likelihood? What is the degree of belief that I have a cavity? And we said point 0.2, okay? So where this, we're going to figure out where this thing comes from right now. Uh, and then I said the lowercase cavity means that the uppercase uh, variable, you can see this at the bottom of the screen, equal true. And then if I have the negation in front, that means the uppercase uh, uh, random variable, it's set to false. And then we ask the, the following question. Now, given that I have partial knowledge, I know it hurts. What is my degree of belief that I have a cavity? Well, now it went up, right? It makes sense, I hope. We covered this already, so I'm just going quickly through. Then I went through a list of English sentences, statements that I, I just went through and I I thought they were, um, you know, they had some meaning with them. But then I guess the semantics got, got lost in the uh, way I presented. And so let's actually figure out what this slide means with some mathematics. OK, 
So, so we start the lesson today, uh, recap of discrete distribution uh, of probabilities. What, what's going on? Because we need this for the uh, naive Bayes uh, and classification. So every time you don't know what's going on, tell me so I can create new slides. Finally, we start. Full joint probability mass distribution. So what is this thing? So I have a mass that I distribute it in different uh, locations. In this specific case, I will have a box which has two by two by two uh, entries. It has buckets, okay? Which is going to be, again, this probability over the three uh, discrete Boolean uh, random variables, toothache, cavity, and uh, hatches, meaning if the probe of the dentist catches in one, one of my teeth, right? So if it catches, it's likely it found something to catch on, which is likely uh, to be a cavity, okay? We don't know if it catches. So that's why it's a random variable. All right. Let's figure out. Uh, this is the table, right? A bunch of numbers. You can think about the whole set of, uh, the whole mass is one kilo. The first entry here is gonna be 180 grams. This is 12 grams. Uh, you have 16 grams, 64 grams, 72, 144, eight grams and half kilo more or less here. And so uh, if you sum all these grams together, you get your one kilogram, okay. So we're going to be starting with the first definition, how this stuff, this, this, this probability work. Okay. So in, on the bottom side of the screen in gray, you see the following. So the probability of a given proposition is going to be given to us by adding the probability mass. So all these grams for all the words that are compatible with the specific preposition. Okay. What does this mean? Let, let's figure this out together. So. Let's say I would like to establish what is the degree of belief, this probability of the following proposition. I have a toothache or I have a cavity or both, okay? So what do we have to do now? What are grams? Grams, the, the thing you measure things uh, outside the United States. Uh, in here you use pounds, that's called LB for Libra, I think it's in Latin. Grams are the things you measure things uh, when you cook, for example, right? Okay, very good. All right, sweet. So here I was talking about the fact that we have to figure out what is the degree of belief of the uh, proposition toothache or cavity. So let's do this together. We have to add up all the weight associated to the compatible words. So what is what does this mean? So here I have toothache happen, right? So all these four entries, are corresponding to the, uh, it, they are compatible with toothache, right? So this is toothache, it happened. So all of these four entries are compatible. And then the cavity, have, uh, if I have a cavity, all these weights are compatible, okay? So if I have this one or this one, how many entries can are they compatible uh, with this specific um, proposition? Can you tell me in the chat? Six, yes, right? Okay, why 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 we said two? So someone said two. I believe you you thought about the having the uh, end, right? So if your two would be correct, if you want to say uh, when uh, when when what is the word where you have a toothache and a cavity? That would be correctly uh, correct two entries. Here I have either a toothache or a cavity or both. Okay, therefore I have to sum the weight, all the grams, right? All these weights for these six entries, okay? Let's do this together. And we're gonna get some number, a 0 0.280, okay? It's fantastic. So this is the degree of belief that one of the two events or both happen, okay? Sweet. Second question, how about the uh, probability of cavity? How about the likelihood, right? How about this degree of belief, yeah, of the statement cavity? Four, can you tell me how much it is? Yeah, yeah, sure. I understand, you know. Can you tell me how much uh, this number is? Oh, where did we see that number before? Can you tell me where we saw that number before? At the top row, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Where, where did we see? Hold on. We, we saw this number here, right? Let me go back. Right? Here, the second last uh, line on the slide. At the periodic dentist checkup, I have this degree, belie degree of belief that is 0.2. Mm. So we actually figure out where that first number comes from. I will ask you afterwards, what else would you like to 
compute, right? Now maybe you understand what's going on. All right, so let me give you some more formal definition here about what, what we just did. So we're gonna be talking about uh, marginalization now. What is this marginalization? So this is the uh, following um, definition. So if I'd like to compute the degree of belief, this probability over a set of random variable, ball capital Y, right? So it's bold because it's a vector, meaning there are multiple, or it's a set of multiple random variables. So if I would like to compute the probability over a specific set of random variable from a probability that has two sets of random variable, Y and Z, I had to sum all the uh, entries for all possible values that capital Z, the set of capital Z variables, uh, take. Okay, So we, we have a set of variable Y, a set of variable Z, and we have a sum over all possible values that capital Z can take. Sweet. So in this case, let's compute uh, the uh, this probability for the set Y just being the cavity itself. So it's just a single random variable. And then the Z being the uh, tuple catch and toothache. OK, so how do we do this? We, we had we said that we're going to be summing the probability over random variables, no longer the preposition. Remember, there's a capital letter here. So we have to sum this first entry, the second entry, the third entry here, and the fourth entry. So we sum all possible combination of catch and toothache. So the first one, the blue one, would be it catches and I have a toothache. The second combination would be um, it, I have a toothache, but it doesn't catch. Then I have it catches, but I don't have a toothache. And then I have it doesn't catch and I don't have a toothache. So there are four possible combinations, of course, two, 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 <laughs> two binary values, right? Uh, you have four possible combinations. So if you sum all these four uh, vectors, you're going to be getting the final vector, which is 0.2 and 0.8, which is the probability of the random variable cavity with a capital C, OK? And we write this to the extreme right of the table, on the margin of the table. That's why it's called marginal. This one is going to be giving us the probability of the random variable cavity. And again, you get it by summing over all the entries. And this is, again, the number you got before. And then you can actually see this is a probability because uh, it sums to 1, OK? All right. So let me back back off to the previous slide again. So this was the first entry. Here we figure out the probability of a is zero two only for cavity, right? So what I was showing you before here, uh, this is p lowercase cavity. Okay. So this statement here means the uh, probability for the random variable capital cavity is equal to true, right? So the lowercase variable. It's the preposition that the uppercase random variable it's equal to true. Does it make sense, uh, Nashra? Point eight is the probability of not getting a cavity. Okay, uh, here, let me show you again. So capital C cavity. Cavity has two. Okay, has two entries, right? The first one would be cavity uh, true on the left hand side, and the second entry is associated to probability for not having a cavity. OK, good. Can you explain again what the capitalized Y mean again? Capital bold Y and capital bold Z are set of variables. OK, in this specific case, my set of variable, uh, random variable is going to be just cavity. And a set of random variable Z is going to be catch and toothache. Here we said that the full joint probability is a probability over three entries toothache, cavity, and catch. Now I'd like to split these three entries in two sets. I take on one side uh, cavity, and the other side I group toothache and catch. Okay, so capital, y, capital bold Y and capital bold Z are set of random variable. And here we were concerned with the computation of the probability over just one of the two items, okay? So probability of an uppercase letter is a vector, yes. And the lowercase letter is a number, correct. So over here, probability of capital cavity. Cavity is a random variable. It can be either true, and so you're going to have 0.2. It's a scalar. Or it can be false, 
you have a scalar, right? So if you compute, if you tell me, if you write down P of cavity, you have 0.2. P of not cavity, lowercase, right? You have 0.8. If you write P of capital cavity, then you get the vector of both entries. Good? We got it? Yes, no, not you. I was talking to way, way, okay. All right, fine. Okay, sure. You're welcome. Uh, what does catch mean? You have a probe. The dentist has a probe. It tries to uh, try all the teeth and it it catches, okay? And the dentist thing, tool, it, it catches or doesn't catch. Do you get? Do you catch? <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to show you was the following here. So now we have this uh, probability, which is called a prior. It's a prior probability over the uh, having a cavity. What would you like now to know? So let's say, oh, it hurts, right? We would like to see how we refine our belief, given that it hurts. Okay, are we understanding what's going on? Yes, no. Yes, good. All right. And so let's figure out how we, that, that's what I wrote here in this, in this slide here. So given that we have the prior and the prior was this uh, probability we just compute through marginalization from the full joint. So you can see given the full joint, I can compute prior. So prior are uh, computable given that you have the full joint. So given, getting the full joint allow you to compute every possible thing. Cool. Now we have some evidence, which is it hurts. Therefore, let's see how we update our belief over having a cavity, okay? And so let's figure out how to compute the posterior, okay? Posterior for the having the cavity, given the evidence it hurts. All right, so posterior. We are back to the previous slide, basically, right? From the one we just left off. So we would like to figure out how to refine our belief over the cavity, given that it hurts. So this is a conditional probability. What is a conditional probability? It's simply the ratio of the probability mass associated to having a cavity and having a toothache. So how do I compute the green entry first here? Tell me. Let's figure out whether we understand what's going on. How do I compute the green entry in this uh, line? From two slides ago, how did we say we compute probabilities over uh, two values? Okay, point, uh, so 108 grams and 12 grams, right? Very good, okay. So the first entry would be the mass associated to having both a cavity and having a toothache. Is this a probability distribution? No, why not? Because how much, uh, given that the toothache happened, uh, what is, how much is the entire weight of the event that toothache happened? What is the orange one? How do we compute the orange? Orange is going to be the weight, right? The probability that I give to, I have to add the first four uh, entries, right? On the left hand side, the first two columns, right? Very, very good. So the orange part would be the entire uh, set, the, the entire weight associated to, uh, it hurts, right? And now I'm going to be using this as a normalization factor to convert these two numbers, point, well, 120 and 80, up to uh, sum into one kilo, right? To, to unity. And so if I do that, I'm going to be having the following point, well, 108 plus 12 divided by 108 plus 12 plus 16 plus 64. Oh, we get 0. 0.6. What was 0. 0.6? 0.6 was exactly what I showed you last uh, on Monday, the last line here. So given it hurts, you actually bump up the degree of belief of having the cavity. Okay, I hope it makes sense. All right, so let me give you the final, um, final slide. So given that we have understood this one, how about the following? How do I compute the probability of not having a cavity given that it hurts? following the uh, protocol we just uh, we just cover right 16 plus 64 right divided by the, the overall mass there right sweet 
Um, and so this would be, again, the, 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 the two not probability because they don't sum to one, the, the two entries divided by the, the, the actual event that uh, happened. Okay, very good. Otherwise, you can also do another one. You can also do one minus 0.6, you get 0.4. Okay, otherwise there are two options. They will, they are uh, equivalent, right? You can figure out uh, yourself why. Okay, so finally, the last slide. Um, what's happening here? All right, this is actually interesting. So some of you might have noticed the following. So we can say that the probability of the random variable cavity, right? So there's gonna be a vector. Given that it hurts, it's proportional to the joint distribution uh, of the random variable cavity and the event that we have a toothache, okay? So in this specific case, I am mixing two different things. The left-hand side, the capital cavity is the random variable. The right-hand side, lowercase toothache, is the uh, preposition, uh, I have a toothache, okay? So we have a sign of value, of value. So the conditional probability, we saw it from the previous slide, was the, that ratio. Therefore, it is, uh, proportional to the joint, although it's not the joint because the joint is not a probability because it doesn't uh, necessarily sum to one, the two entries, right? And so how can we fix that? Well, we can fix it by simply computing alpha such that those two numbers will sum to one. Let me show you. So I, how do I compute this thing, right? So first of all, I'm going to be summing the two uh, entries for it catches or it doesn't catch. Okay, so I sum two vectors. Uh, so I basically marginalize out the, the catching part, right? Remember, I'd like to remove one of the variable from the, uh, the joint. I just have to sum all possible things. So by summing the two entries, uh, it, either it catches or it doesn't catch, then it, it will remove the, uh, that factor from the uh, probability. And so if I sum these two numbers, I'm going to get something like 120 and 80, which I still have to rescale such that the sum of the two entries gives me the one kilo. Okay. Make sense? We're going to be using this actually uh, soon. So the interesting thing here, okay. The interesting thing here is if I ask you, which of the two entries is the largest one? the uh, having the cavity or having not the cavity. So if, uh, if, I, if you have the conditional probability, given that you have the toothache, you can just tell me, oh, the, the, the first argument, the 0.6 is larger than 0.4. But you don't need to actually compute, you don't need to compute the normalization factor in order to figure out that the first entry is larger than the second entry. As long as you have the joint here, right, the unnormalized, uh, conditional, which is again, just the joint, you can automatically tell me 120 is larger than 80. Okay. So you don't need to actually figure out how much alpha is. If the question is, is more likely that I have a cavity or I don't have a cavity given that I have a toothache, right? So the question that I just asked you, whether you have or not the cavity given that you, it hurts, it doesn't actually require to compute the conditional probability, nor to compute the normalization factor, because those two numbers are going to be in the same ratio anyway, right? So you can automatically just use the, uh, the joint that we, got, we obtain, well, the marginal in this case, that we obtain by summing out the, uh, the variables that we don't care, and then we figure out which of the two entries are the largest. Okay, let me see. There was a question here. I don't understand how we came to the conclusion of adding the catches. Okay, so here I just show you before. If I would like to remove something, okay, I just have to sum over all possible uh, values that something takes. Okay, in this specific case, I, I understand I skip a few steps. Yes, in this specific case, my uh, I have the the three variables would be cavity, toothache, and catch. Z would be catch, and then Y would be cavity and toothache. If I would like to remove the catch, then I have to sum up 
all possible value, right? I have to sum up all possible value catch takes, which is either it catches or it doesn't catch. That's why to marginalize out the catching factor, I will have to sum the vector uh, associated to uh, having a toothache and it catches and the vector of having a toothache and it doesn't catch. Why two entry? Because I don't check for the preposition. I check for the random variable. Let me see whether uh, the student is satisfied. I lost the question. And if I don't know, uh, okay. N Nashra, does it make sense? Yes, no, I think so. That's great. Anyway, we share the slides after class. You can go over it again. Once again, chapter number 12 of our textbook, it's really good. I really recommend checking it out. Again, uh, the notation is slightly different. I try to be as close as possible. There are many questions here. Why do we need alpha here? Alpha uh, is needed because we said in the previous slide that the conditional probability is given to you by the ratio of the joint and the uh, basic probability of observing the specific event. Right? So these two things, left side, right side, are not the same thing. If I remove this number from the bottom, then I have to write here a, a multiplier, right? which is basically acting as the probability on the bottom, well, one over probability. This probability here, the probability of the event uh, of having a toothache acts as a normalization factor that allows us to get the joint over here, over cavity, to sum over uh, to sum to one, okay. Okay, so actually a equal no a equal one over p two thick, right? Alpha is on the numerator, p two thick is a den denominator. We don't use alpha to compute two, p two thick because we don't care about what is the probability uh, you uh, got a two thick. It you got the two thick. It hurts. I. I, there is no more belief. It happened, right? Given that it happened, now I have to basically uh, partition my whole space, my, my whole table. I chunk out everything here, right? So everything on the right hand side, I have to remove because the event uh, toothache happened. Therefore, the mass that was spread one kilo, one kilogram that was spread across the entire table now is going to be redistributed over the reminder. So if it was one kilo over the entire table, now I remove the right hand side, it has to be again one kilo over the possible random event because probabilities have to sum to one kilogram, right? If you want. Again, I, I hope that I'm not confusing you with these grams and kilograms. Oh, I think so. Why do we need alpha? I already told you. How do you get the jump from alpha Okay, okay, fine. Uh, let me get the last one. So here, I have to figure out, uh, well, since this is a probability of a random variable, a probability of a random variable has to sum to one. 120 plus 80 doesn't sum to one, right? It sums to 200. Therefore, well, 0 0.2, right? Therefore, alpha needs to be five, right? Two, four, six, ten, right? Okay. Makes sense. Uh, who's, who asked this question? Where is it? Uh, alpha equal five. Yes, that's correct. Right? But alpha doesn't, I don't care about alpha. The point was the following, right? So my question, I repeat the question because that's relevant for the actual uh, uh, classification task. Given that you have the joint, right? The, and this over here in the in the in the angular brackets. If I ask you, given that you it hurts, do you think you have a cavity or not? Can you answer this question? Given the uh, unnormalized probability, right? Given the joint, yes, you can because there is more weight. There are 100, 120 grams on the uh, case that you, you on the like the, the belief of having a cavity weights 120 grams versus not having a cavity that weighs 80 grams. So you are more uh, of the idea that you have a cavity, right? That you don't need to, if you don't need the exact uh, probability number, just either you have it or you don't. If you make, have, if you had to make a choice, right? You, make it, you can make the choice, which one is the largest 
even though they are not normalized, right? Normalization doesn't change which one is the largest. You multiply everything by a, a, a number that is larger than one, it bumps up everything, right? Okay. Higher chance of having a cavity than not if it hurts. Correct. And this is true regardless of the fact that these are probabilities or unnormalized probabilities. That's the whole point. Just to make probabilities, set. that's correct. The ratio is the same. Correct. All right, done. Well, let me just quickly go as well through this one, just quickly, quickly, uh, such that we can move forward. So Bayes' rule, we said, it states the fact that you can flip the causal direction to the diagnostic direction. And then I wrote this, uh, this is the definition. So given that you have the cause, you might have some effects. Right? And then you would like to figure out, so that's basically uh, the cause is, uh, I don't know, you got the flu, the effect, you, you have a fever. But then the other way, the diagnostic direction is that, oh, I have a fever. What, what caused the, 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 the fever, right? That's the diagnostic, figure out the other way around. And the interesting thing is that the two conditional probabilities are actually um, related by this uh, equation. And the last line is what I just showed you, this marginalization, right? If you multiply these two things together, you have effect and cause. And then the second one is going to be effect and not cause. You sum up the two things, you're going to get just the P of effect. Why did I express these two um, joint as the multiplication? Because it's likely that you have uh, access to this number rather than the joint number. Okay. And then finally, last slide, just uh, we said that the naive assumption or for Bayes is just that all the effects are independent given uh, we observe the cause, okay? And so here I show this one in a mathematic sense. And then actually here I improve the formulation. So if you have this joint over three uh, random variable, the cause, effect one, effect two, I can put a bar on the, on the left-hand side here and I put E2 and C on the right-hand side. And then I multiply by these two things, right? So if you multiply these two together, you're going to get back the joint. And then you take this joint here. You can split this joint again. You put a bar here. You multiply the probability of the thing that goes to the right-hand side. You see? You put a bar, two things on the right, and the two things on the right pop out. I put a bar here. The thing on the right pops out, right? So this is how this chain rule works for probabilities. And naive base simply says this effect you can remove it. The probability of uh, the effect one is independent of the effect two, given that you observed the actual cause. Okay, and that's all naive basis. Okay, so let's get back now to where we left off in our uh, quest for learning about classification with uh, naive base. So the point is that naive base allows us to compute the joint probability, which is our model, our knowledge base, the entire knowledge of how each of these random variables uh, interact with each other, right? So we, given that we have this full joint probability mass distribution, therefore we can compute everything. As I just showed, you can compute marginal, you can compute conditional, you can compute any possible question. One question of which is gonna be the one I just asked you before, do you think I have a cavity or not, given that it hurts, right? So the question would be, is it a spam or not a spam, given that I see this character? Or is this a three or a eight, given that I see these pixels, okay? And so if I had to make a decision over a conditional probability, as I just showed you in the previous slide, you don't necessarily need to compute the conditional probability. You don't only need to compute the joint because you can tell, again, which one is the uh, highest one even before the normalization. You don't need to normalize to tell me which one is the highest. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So this requires all events to be independent, right? Uh, so we have no events. We have effects given the cause. Okay. So naive base says the following. He assumes conditional independence uh, given that you observe the, the cause, okay? Given dependence of, of the effect. This is, this is an assumption. So if you uh, 
if you believe this is true, then I can simplify this um, chain rule by removing all the effects from the right hand side of the conditional bar. Okay. Is this true? Well, not necessarily. Uh, does it work? Somehow it works for some uh, simple cases. The, the, the point here with this naive base uh, is to actually understand how we uh, can build a full joint probability distributions. And then given the full joint probability distribution, ask questions that are of our interest in order to perform a specific task that you know, uh, is one of the most uh, powerful and common tasks in machine learning, which is classification with a probabilistic model. So how do we use a probabilistic model to do classification? We first build the whole model, the joint probability distribution, and then we ask the different questions. We said, if we want to pick the most probable event, we don't necessarily need to compute the posterior. We can just use the unnormalized uh, joint for which we replace the random variable with the actual observation, with the actual evidence, okay? Again, this is an assumption. A naive base makes this assumption, which allows us to simplify a lot the creation of the uh, model, which is this full joint probability distribution. Okay, got it. Good. Recapping and re re restarting here and just quickly. So naive base, as I just told you <laughs> one more time, uh, assumes that all features are independent. So all effects are independent uh, of the label, the cause. It allows us to make a simple digit recognition uh, version. For example, the features F, I, J are going to be uh, associated to each location in the, in the image. They are going to be binary and are going to be either on or off based on the level of intensity of that specific pixel. So for example, again here, if I have this specific bunch of pixels, I have uh, again a discretization of 15 by 15 uh, boxes overall pixels. Then I had the feature 0, 0 is going to be 0, is off. 0, 1 is 0, off. 0, 2, oh, might be 1 because I have uh, hit the first pixel, dark pixel of the 1. I have the second one, also 1, then all zeros, right? Because you have a 1 here, you have 0, 0, 0, 0, then you have 1, 1, then 0, 0, 0, 0. All of them are off. All the ones, the, all the ones that are active are in the, in the central part. Um, there are a lot of features. Uh, each of them are uh, binary. Doesn't matter this graph, what it means. So the naive base model, as we said, allows us to compute the full joint here as the product of all the conditional. That's the major uh, simplification here. So what do we have to learn? Well, we figure that in a bit. So here, oh, well, actually, I'll tell you now what we have to learn. So here we said that we have first this uh, prior probability is a vector because the uh, variable is a capital letter, right? So it's a random variable that takes, in this case, 10 different values from 0 to 9. And in this case, the prior distribution is going to be, again, this one kilogram split in, uh, in 10 different parts, right? 100 grams for each uh, entry. In the other case, we have the conditional probability of having the feature 3, 1 on given the specific class. This one is going to be, of course, just one statement, right? So this is like a preposition. But then on the right hand side, you have the random variable. And so given that this random variable takes 10 different values, I will have 10 different probability masses associated to having the feature 3, 1 activated. So for the one, it's unlikely that this pixel is dark, right? If you have a one, the one stays here, it's going to be unlikely, right? For the two, mm, also not likely. Three, no. But again, if you go down to a six, oh, well, you write a six like that, right? And so if you write like a six like this, this pixel here, it's likely to be on. And so these are basically the frequencies with this specific feature is on, given that you observe the specific class, okay? Cool. How about this other location here? Okay. This other location for the number three is actually very high because it's in most of the threes, actually in 90% of my threes, this pixel was on. That's why I will, I'm writing here 0.9. So this is again telling me that 90% of my trees will have this pixel on. In reality, pixels of images are not independent of each other. Absolutely. That's very good point. 
So all you see here in this slide is so only for making you understand uh, how this probabilistic modeling works. The, the process of doing the thing. Does it actually work? No. That's why we're going to be covering a convolutional neural network in a few weeks. Okay. And there we actually exploit the uh, probability of neighboring pixels. Okay. So we'll see uh, how to do that. And you'll also have the programming assignment number four. Uh, you're going to be training a convolutional neural network to spell out the uh, English uh, word three for the number three. Okay. So that's going to be programming assignment four. You send a digit of a three, like a picture of a three, and then your neural network will have to spell out T H R double E. Okay. Almost ready. Almost ready. That one uh, is in preparation. Are these probabilities based on a set of samples? Yes. So I'll, I'll cover, I cover that in a, in a few slides, but these are basically the, uh, frequencies, uh, with which each of these feature uh, was on given my entire collection of digits. Okay. We, we cover uh, learning in a, in a two slides. Okay. So, uh, blah, 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 again, repeating ourselves, a general, uh, naive base model, uh, gives us again, the fact that the full joint, again, this overall, uh, table on the left hand side is given to us by the product of the, uh, prior and then all these conditionals. And then we, we said here, the left hand side table has a uh, size of Y. So for the digit case, we have 10 possible values for uh, Y, right? 10 different digits. And then you multiply by how many numbers can F take to, right? Binary in this case features to the N, right? I have two to the N possible pixel combination. Are all of these, Meaningful? No, absolutely not. So again, we'll see in a few, in a few lessons, uh, how we actually do proper things with pixels. Anyway, for, for the moment, let's go with this thing. So these are the total number of values. There are many values. So you would have to think about learning all possible, all these things, like all these values is way too many, uh, numbers to infer, like to, to figure out, to learn given your data, this would require having a lot of data. And many of these actually are not even happening. So how do you estimate things that don't happen? Ah, that's actually very dangerous. <laughs> we'll see that in a few slides as well. Right, on the right hand side, instead, we have the PY, again, those 10 prior probabilities, 100 grams for each of the 10 digits, I said. And then on the right hand side, you have that for each of the N features, right? F, uh, we have F1 to N and these are again, see, that's why I like to write the lowercase N equal one to N. I get very confused with this notation. So here we have N different features, which is uh, this N over here, uh, multiplied by how many values they can take. In this case, there are binaries. So we have two and then multiply by how many entries, uh, how many entries we have in this table. Well, we have one of we have these two values right for each feature for each condition right and therefore in total here we just have 10 and then n times so it's going to be the number of features right number of pixels times the number of values two times 10 again which are way less than this number on the left hand side so we only have to specify how each feature depends on the class we don't have to uh, model the cross feature interaction, given that we take this a very naive assumption. So the total number of parameters now it's linear in N, whereas before it was exponential. That was a disaster. Uh, model is very simplistic, but you know, might, might actually work. All right. So let's, uh, get back to where we uh, got kind of lost last, uh, last lesson and see whether we can actually make sense. So the goal is to compute the posterior probability, um, over the label Y to make the uh, the choice whether which class actually ha happened, right? Uh, step one is going to be getting the uh, joint probability of the label and evidence for each uh, label. So here we have the uh, the joint, which is again given to us since this is a random variable that takes, let's say, 10 possible uh, values. We have the one for uh, this first scalar, right? It's lowercase. So we have the first option, the first class, second class, and so on until the last class. 
Given that we replace, we have observed these specific features, right? This is the evidence. So then we can uh, get these uh, joint probabilities by using the naive Bayes approximation by multiplying all these conditionals, okay, for each specific uh, class. Then if I sum all of these up, you have all possible values for the y that are sum, right? And therefore you basically marginalize out your y. Why do we use this? Well, we can use this one as the normalization underneath. Like if I divide this one, I get automatically the conditional. That's how we define it, uh, our conditional probability in, in the black set of slides, okay? So if I'd like to compute the posterior, so I would like to figure out what is the probability of observing the digit three, like the, the class three, given these features, to compute this probability, I take the joint over here. The joint was given to us by the multiplication of all this probability, the, all these conditionals times the prior. If I sum up all these numbers, these 10 numbers overall, I'm gonna get this normalization factor, the one over alpha, basically. And so if you divide the joint by this normalization factor, the probability of the evidence, therefore you're gonna get in the conditional. In, uh, in this case, how do we get these numbers, right? So for naive base spam filter, we have to perform data collection, which is gonna be like a collection of emails labeled with spam or ham. Someone has to do this by hand. And then we have to actually split them into a training set and held out set and test set, such that we can actually evaluate the performance of our model after that has been trained on the training set on a held out set, such that we can decide uh, how to better tune our uh, hyperparameter. We have not, we don't have hyperparameter just yet. We're going to be introducing one very soon. Once you have the best performance on validation set on the held out set, then you can finally establish what is the performance on this set that you never actually seen before, which is this test set. Do F1, Fn here means all n pixels are on. Now F1 to Fn are going to be uh, the specific value for each of these features, right? So the, not necessarily all on uh, the com the whole. It's going to be the specific uh, combination of uh, features that are on. Okay, looks very useful, but uh, look sharp. I don't know what it means. Look sharp. <laughs> All right. So uh, classifiers. Uh, we are going to be learning on the training set. We tune our algorithm on the uh, held out set. We are going to be finally evaluating on the test set, but we cannot touch the system uh, given this knowledge. Right? Otherwise you pollute your model. All right, so how does it work for text instead? So we're gonna be using the bag of word uh, approach in this case. We have, again, this email such that uh, each word is going to be like uh, represented here with a WI, capital W is gonna be this random variable associated to the uh, ith word in our email. How many variables are there? How many variables are there in my email? How can you tell me how many random variables I have given a specific email? Word count, that's correct. How many values each of these random variables can have? Number of unique words, mm, possibly, yeah, but not. Number of words there are. Mm. Where? Okay, there are where? Uh, can you? Okay, number of unique characters, right? So more or less. So let me act answer the actual second questions. How many values it can take? Um, so this is gonna it's gonna be based on the vocabulary we we choose. So given that I choose a vocabulary of one thousand words, ten thousand words then uh, this random variable can take any of these 10,000 possible values, which are my uh, vocabul vocabulary size. Is there a specific dictionary we can use for the random variable? Yeah, like you take Oxford dictionary and that works very well, right? You can just see uh, the index, the number, you can count the, let the, the word, then you see which, which word is which, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, as before, we're going to be predicting the label condition on the feature uh, variable. In this case, again, the label is going to be spam or ham. Uh, as before, we assume features are conditionally independent given the label. 
is this correct? Well, not, right? All the words are somehow related to the other word, but here we just say, oh, we just get them all in a big bag. We don't care about the order of the words. I'm just, you know, fine. Uh, each uh, WI is identically distributed. So each word has a, the same probability distribution. So the joint probability distribution is going to be, again, this multiplication of all the conditional probabilities multiply by the uh, the prior. So prior is going to be either uh, two numbers, right? This is going to be the probability of either spam or not spam. My my, what is my prior knowledge? What do I think it usually happens? And then on the right hand side is going to be, given that it's spam, what is the probability of observing this specific word uh, in position i? So word at position i, not the i word in the dictionary, but anyway. So tie distribution and bag of word means that uh, usually each variable gets its own conditional probability. Uh, but back in the, in the in the bag of the word model, each position is identically distributed. All positions uh, share the same conditional probability. Why do we make this assumption? Let me know. Does the order of the word matter? No. Here we actually say that we don't. We say it will not matter. Does it matter actually if in reality? Well, as we saw before, you see dollar signs like money or you see uh, urgent or something like just the fact that these words appear, regardless of where they appear, are a indicator of some emails being, uh, you know, uh, spam rather than ham, right? So you have like some sort of get this, uh, whatever advertisement you get. I'm, I'm thinking a bad example, sorry. <laughs> Uh, whatever you, you get in your inbox, right? There's a lot of spam that is, um, yeah, having very clear uh, words that are indicating such a thing. So in say this case, we say, uh, why in this case is the class, okay? In this case, is spam or ham. In the case before, why the target was one of the 10 possible digits from zero to nine. Uh, we'll talk about NLP transformers very soon. Don't worry. How would misspelling titles or differences like color versus color affect this? Would we just not count them as valid word? It's a very good question. We're going to be talking about natural language processing in a very in a few weeks. Don't worry. Uh, let's just go forward with this classification example. <laughs> okay, I will answer these questions in a few weeks. Don't worry. Uh, now we are just treating, uh, just talking about how to perform classification with naive base for different examples. Then we see again in later classes how to do this properly with convolutional networks, how to do this properly with transformers, and and so on. Okay. So model the uh, the joint probability. What are the parameters? Now that's the answer the question you asked me before. So we have either p of y again. This should be a bold p is a vector. I forgot to update this. I have the probability of having uh, the word specific word given to spam. Oh, I have here the probability of the word given that is ham. Okay, so the probability uh, of uh, spam or ham is the following. I assume that two thirds. Well, I can also compute this. I can compute that two thirds of my emails are good emails. One third are actually uh, spam. So these are my estimate for which of the two classes it's more likely to be. And now, what do you think are going to be the most probable words given for a spam mail? Well, whatever you're thinking, I guess it's not the following. So the most common words for spam are the, to, and, of, you, a, with, from. Wow, okay, very indicative of being a spam. How about the most common uh, words for a ham? The two of 2002 with from and a wow okay this is very uh, not uh, maybe as expected the only thing that is funny here well is the 2002 that's exactly when the data was collected right so that's where you get the 2002 all the other words are basically filling words that are very very common in any email right so they are the most common words they are not most common for a specific class okay where are the important words well down 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 the table right. OK, so let's figure out how to compute here whether something is a spam or not a spam. So we start, we have, we, let's compute this model, right? This um, 
the full joint. We have to do a multi set of multiplications. Uh, I don't like multiplications. I prefer additions. So how can I convert uh, multiplications into addition? I don't know how to do multiplications. How can I convert multiplications into additions? I take the log. Very good. Okay. Uh, moreover, these allow us to avoid uh, underflowing uh, in a flood employed representation. So we start with this prior. Uh, I have, again, the prior of being one third spam and one two thirds ham, right? This is not the conditional. This is just the prior. So if you take the logarithm of these two numbers, you're going to get a negative number, obviously. You get a negative 1.1 for the uh, spam, and then you get negative 0.4 or a hand. So if we stop by, if we stop here, we don't go forward, we don't check the email. What is your guess that you have an email uh, that is ham or a spam? Which one is the two? Which of the two uh, is the case? We think it's a ham by default, right? So what is the uh, lowest performance of a classifier in this case, if you can understand the question? If you have a, a very stupid classifier that is always saying uh, hem, it's gonna get 66%, right? Not 0.5. If, if it's random, yeah, it's not, you can do better than random. You can do run, uh, better than random by always say it's hem, right? But then this spam filter doesn't work, right? If everything comes through. So 66 is my uh, baseline. I have to do just better than that. It's not gonna be too hard. All right, so we observe the first word. First word, okay, that was the prior. First word is going to be Gary. Okay, Gary has uh, a higher probability for being ham because Gary maybe is the name of the actual receive, recipient. And so we sum now uh, the logarithms and we're going to get negative 11.8, negative 8.9. So, so it's still a ham. Then I'm going to get the second word, right? So lowercase w means I observe the, the w1. I, I, it's uh, the order of animation is flipped. There should happen the, the left one first. But anyway, so I observe the second word here, and the second word is going to be wood. Gary wood. This is still a uh, higher probability for ham. So the total sum it's less low for the ham. Would you? Oh, you. It, you actually has a higher probability for spam. So now. Uh, spam is actually not decreasing as much as ham. And then would you like to lose weight <laughs> while you sleep? Yes, we would like to lose weight. But anyway, so if you keep summing the uh, conditional probabilities, you have now that the final log joint, it's negative 66 for spam and negative 80.5 for ham. So what is our classifier going to tell us? It's spam, right? It's spam because it has a higher log probability. Okay? How can we get back to the uh, probabilities? How, how can I convert these two numbers into probabilities? So I take the exponent, and then what happens if I take the exponent? So let, let's do this maybe together, right? So let's do this. So let me do conda activate uh, book. And then I do IPython, IPython, and I do PyLab. Okay. Okay. So here we have a terminal and we have the two numbers negative 76 and negative 80.5. Okay. So here we have our two numbers our log P. Well, log joint, right? Log joint uh, equal array of these two things, right? Negative 76 and negative 80.5. All right, let's see. Log joint. Okay, works. So if I take uh, the exponential of this log joint, we have these two numbers here, which are very tiny. Okay, so these are not probabilities. How do we get probabilities? Well, we have to normalize this thing, right? And so we can do exponential of log joint divided by the sum of the exponential, right? Of the log joint, right? If these are probability, they had to sum to one. 
So I get the exponentiated thing. I sum the two components, the two exponential, and I divide my exponentiated log probabilities by the thing. And so here we have 99%. Yes, okay, very good, Edison. I'll get in there. So I'm getting 99% for uh, ham, spam, and uh, point, uh, point zero 0.01 for ham. But then as Edison pointed out, this is actually leading to underflow, right? Uh, I mean, this can create very big issues. Do you see this big number? Well, this negative, big negative number. So what is the proper way of doing this? I show you, I explain to you next time, but I'll just show you. Let's do import torch, okay? We'll figure out in soon what this stuff does. So let's call this one for now. Soft argmax is my function that unfortunately is misspelled in Torch, which is uh, misspelled this way, okay? So soft argmax is the correct uh, word. And so we have these two numbers here. We have, we have the log joint. Instead, instead of doing the array, I'm gonna be doing something similar. Torch dot answer, answer. Okay, so if I type log joint, how do I go to the right? Oh, there you go, it works. Log joint is gonna be the same number as we started. Uh, and now I'm gonna be computing soft. Ah, I see, now I understand. Soft dark max of log joint. And then we have to say dimension minus one. Oh, there we go. So we cover this in a, in a few episodes in the future, don't worry. But then how here I computed, I, I use this soft dark max, which is misspelled in, uh, in Torch and everywhere else in uh, outside this course as soft max. And they forget to, to put the arg uh, after the soft. So the soft dark max allows us to convert a bunch of unnormalized log probabilities into a probability uh, vector, okay? And as you can see, if we sum these two entries together, right? If I do this dot sum, you're gonna get one, okay? What is torch? What is the terminal? Again, we we'll see this in the future. Just this is for giving you a little bit of, uh, you know, some, some something in advance, okay? Uh, so we almost get, we almost finished. So we got these numbers, which, which were unnormalized log probability. Why are unnormalized? Because these are the joint, right? Log joint. It's not a probability. It's a log joint where we substituted the uh, random variable for the values. To compute the actual probability, you still have to normalize. Do we need to normalize to tell me which one is the uh, smaller number or larger number? No, right? Uh, well, the less negative number. No, you don't need to, right? So you don't, you just need to sum numbers at this point. You don't have to, why is minus one? Yes, we cover, okay, minus one is a bug, okay? <laughs> that minus one is a bug in the, in the, in the, in the code. I, I'll tell you in, a, we'll cover Torch and all his uh, bugs in, a, in the future lessons. Uh, in the, for, for now, I can just tell you that the default dimension of the summation is in the wrong index. I tried to send a bug report and then they're like, oh, we already shipped this and everyone is uh, consistently using our bugs. I'm like, okay, fine. So it, it wouldn't be back compatible if I patch the behavior, okay? Um, for doing addition instead of multiplication, why do we turn them into logs in the first place? It's more computationally efficient. No, it is more, well, because you have double operations, it's not more computationally efficient. The point is that it, if you keep multiplying by small numbers, you will start to sum the exponential in the floating point representation. If you think about floating point, you have the mantissa and then you have the exponent, right? If you time, every time you multiply, you actually are increasing those exponential and then you can just go underneath the smallest number that is possibly representable with floating point representation. If you use logs, logs are not going anywhere when you sum them. It there takes forever for, for them uh, to, 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 to grow. Okay. How well, we have too many questions. What's going on? How do we get the total spam for the first entry? Isn't log point three about point? Uh, uh, uh? Uh, log means uh, uh, natural log, right? 
if I do ln of 0.3, negative 0.2, right? If I put more threes inside, negative 0.1, 1.1. Right, so in mathematics, we write LOG for the natural law. Okay, we ran out of time. So that was pretty much, I guess, well, that was, uh, I wanted to talk more, but I guess we are, it makes it makes more sense to actually understand what's going on rather than just covering material. So let me give you the last slide, then we can stop there. So what do we need in order to do naive Bayes? So inference method, we just saw this part over here. We start with a bunch of probabilities, the uh, prior and the conditionals. Uh, we use standard inference to compute the posterior. Well, we don't even need to do that, right? We just get the uh, log joint, nothing new. Uh, how do we estimate the local conditional probabilities? That's the question you asked me before. That's what we cover on Monday. Uh, P of Y, where did we get these numbers? Uh, the prior of the label. Where do we get these conditional of the features given the target? Where do we get all of these things? So these are probabilities that are collectively called the parameters of my model and are denoted as a theta vector here. Until now, we assume these appear magically from the slides, but next time we start with the, well, that typically come from training data accounts. And so next week we start with this parameter estimation. So we, how do we learn these probability uh, numbers, right, these masses, given that we observe uh, data. Thank you so much for being with me today. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. If you have questions, type them on Campus Wire. If you have private questions, type a private question, or you can actually write a private message. If you would like me to create new slides, the black one where I clarify some specific topics that are a little bit you know, foggy, let me know. I will create material as we are going through the course. Thank you so much. Enjoy lunch. <laughs> No questions. Very good. All right. Enough questions, right? <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.